good, 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 good afternoon because I saw some people from Kenya also. So it's my pleasure to introduce Anna, Dr. Anna Kelos from the Kansas State University. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so Anna Kelos completed her, uh, her bachelor and master in entomology at Purdue University and just completed her PhD uh, in store product entomology at Kansas State University. Uh, she is interested in global food security, international development, women empowerment, insect biochemistry and physiology, and insect behavior. And I just discovered that she also likes Ririn Gecko. So thank you for coming. And yes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as Sylvana said, I'm Dr. Hannah Colhorst, and I'm coming from Kansas State University in the U.S., so thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, international collaborative projects that I've been a part of um, during my PhD and then also during my master's research, so I hope you enjoy. There we go. Um, so just to um, remind us all, if you're not familiar, what are stored products? So stored products consist of different goods, specifically dried goods after harvest as they're transported along the supply and value chain. And so you can see we have this corn here. It's starting out in the field. Then it's moving um, transportation from the field. It might end up in processing. Maybe it's made into flour. And then that product can go into storage. It might be in storage for a really long time or shorter periods of time. And then we see that product end up on your local retailer's sh uh, shelves. So at your local grocery store or wherever you pick up your goods. And then finally you bring that home um, to your pantry for your use. Now, these different stored products, specifically cereal grains, make up 60 to 80 percent of the world's calories. So they're really important for human survival and specifically uh, wheat, corn and rice. And these stores of grain are really valuable as well. So just in the U.S., um, they account for nearly $86 billion per year. And again, that's just one country, one year. So they're very valuable crops for human survival. Now, maize specifically is one of the most important crops for the world. And in some areas, it is the number one crop. And obviously, as you can see, it's made into a variety of different foods, but it's also really important um, as different products and for feed and livestock as well. However, there's always a but. Uh, we lose up to 30% or a third of our food just to insect pests after harvest. And this doesn't even count, like count for rodents and other losses that occur after that uh, harvest period. So with that, I just wanna introduce the insect pests that I've focused most of my research on. And not only that, it is a major pest of maize for a large part of the world. So Persephonis truncatus or the larger grain borer. And just a little bit about this pest, it's a primary pest, meaning that it can attack whole undamaged kernels. So it can do a lot of damage um, and really turn the grain into residues, literal flour in a very short period of time. Um, also just some life history traits um, that might make sense based on the research I'm gonna present later. They're kind of weak walking insects. So you can see um, their short little legs in comparison to their really heavy body. They often fall over a lot in lab experiments, um, but they're really strong flyers. Now, the larger grain borer, um, not a lot of attention was paid to this insect globally um, until around the 1970s when it was accidentally introduced into Africa, um, specifically Tanzania. And after that point, it really spread rapidly and it was decimating smallholders. So it was causing a lot of damage. And even today, we're still seeing a lot of issues with this insect, even after all those years. 
Now, as I mentioned, the larger grain borer, it's devastating and invasive um, for much of the world. Um, but currently, it's only really tropical and subtropical in distribution. Um, but given rising temperatures, climate change, we have a lot of potential for this insect pest to spread to more temperate regions of the world. Um, and we've already seen it appear um, in a few places in the southern US um, and also in Europe. So it is moving around. And as we see those temperatures rising, could be more of an issue. Now, before I get into my work, I just want to give a little brief background on some movement ecology for this pest. So the larger grain borer historically was known as a wood boring pest or feeding on woody hosts and trees, not really sure which, um, but at some point it made the switch to feeding on field crops, so corn, cassava. Um, and so we might have this insect kind of in the natural environment uh, where you might have those woody hosts. Um, then we see the insect move into the field where it can infest the crop there, but it can also infest the crop at the point of storage. Um, and then as we see uh, the density of the insect in this environment increase, we might see the larger grain borer again move out and disperse into the natural environment again. Or if we have this crop taken out of storage, we might then see the insect move as well. Now, as it's moving, what is it bringing with it? So really my question um, going forward was, what kind of microbials, bacteria, fungus are moving along with this insect as it's dispersing throughout the environment? What is it bringing to our food? So just a little background about stored product insects and microbes. It's not been well uh, studied, at least in the stored products area, but there have been a few works that I just want to highlight um, for this type of research. So we had a recent review by Ponce et al., um, which looked at stored product insects and microbes. Um, and most of the studies really are focusing on um, different fungal volatiles and how they might be attracting or repelling these insects. We also had a really interesting work in 2008, um, which was photographing the spores on the cigarette beetle cuticle. So that was a pretty interesting study. We also had two works by Euseglio in 2017 and 2020 um, that looked again on the maize weevil or Cytophilus sea maize and the different fungal volatiles and how they were impacting the insect. One of the few studies that we see um, actually looking at the vectoring of microbes with um, stored product insects was in 1995, and it was looking at aflatoxin and the maize weevil or Cytophilus sea maize. So really we have no work investigating these insect microbe interactions with the larger grain borer specifically um, or the maize weevil. So that was the focus of my work. So that leads to kind of an overview of my project. So this was uh, my PhD work funded by a NIFA predoctoral fellowship and, and in collaboration with many partners, um, including you here at CIMIT, which I'll highlight in a moment. Um, my goal was to look at the microbes that were being vectored by the larger grain borer over a variety of these environments. So we have the lab colony as kind of a standard starting point. And then we have collecting insects from the field, around post-harvest facilities, and then in those natural environments. So based on where we're trapping, it could be a prairie, it could be a forest, um, it could be kind of a dry um, area. And then really taking those insects, placing them on agar and looking at what they're vectoring. So just want to highlight um, the trapping uh, that I did in collaboration. I did trapping for the larger grain borer all the way from Canada to Mexico, um, and then a little bit in Greece. And I did this um, in collaboration with many, um, including all of you here at CIMIT, um, but other universities in the US, along with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, University of Thessaly and Volos, Greece, um, and then the USDA ARS uh, Research Service in the US. And so at each site, um, I had, again, the row crop, the post-harvest facility, and the more natural landscape where we were trapping. So we looked at these three habitats, and we had nine traps at each. 
We had two types of sampling. Um, some was more in depth, meaning that it was weekly um, during 2021, 2022, um, and parts of 2023. Um, but then we had less intensive sampling. So this could be, you know, if the collaborators not able to sample for us that often. Um, maybe it was just a week during a given month um, during the growing season. At each site, we had these lingering funnel traps, as you can see here, but we also had dome traps to collect insects that may be more um, walking instead of flying. And we had these different pheromone lures, the larger grain borer lure, uh, the cytophilus lure for maize weevil and rice weevil, a multi-species lure, and then the lesser grain borer lure. So I just wanted to show some pictures um, from the trapping here, but also in Greece. So in Greece, you can see we have um, these lingering funnels and dome traps among uh, the stored products at a warehouse. We can see uh, the same traps around some of the grain silos and bins. And then there I am in the field trapping in more of that natural environment. And then you can see some traps here, again, in some trees, and then we have um, the field where we're capturing as well. And here are some photos, um, courtesy of Sylvanus here, um, of your trapping for the larger grain borer around Simmet. Um, and you can see already there's some larger grain borer in the trap here. We have the trapping in the field and then kind of in this more wooded area or border area along the field. You can see more pictures here, um, collecting the insects in the field. And then I included these photos because for me, it's really interesting. You can see that the larger grain borer has actually chewed holes in the dome trap, which just highlights how powerful their mandibles really are. And then you can also see here, this is the pheromone. Um, you can see the larger grain borer has chewed into the plastic casing for the pheromone to get as close as possible. So. To me, that's pretty awesome. So just to summarize the trapping that we did in 2021 and 2022, so we captured almost 11,000 insects in 2021. Um, for 2022, we haven't uh, assessed all that data yet due to some shipping issues, but so far we have about 3,000 insects and counting, and we identified a total of 35 different taxa um, of different stored product insects that we found. So I just wanna highlight a little bit of the habitat effect. So as I mentioned, we're trapping from those three different areas. So here you can see the weekly trap capture of the stored product insects, and then the different species that I've highlighted. And then we have in yellow is food facility, blue is like the native environment, and the red is a row crop. So you can see here for Rhizopertha dominica or the lesser grain borer, you can see that most of the insects are being captured only at a food facility. When we look at Bostricidae here, now this could include some Rhizopertha dominica as well, but for the most part, this might be more native um, species that are being captured, um, not necessarily stored product insects. You can see they're being really only found in those native spaces. And then just highlighting Trochoderma here, you can see that it's kind of a mixture. We have a lot of insects being captured at the food facility. We have a lot of insects being captured in the field, but not so many in that native like in between space. And then here, um, I'm just showing you the weekly trap capture of stored product insects over time. And I'm highlighting three of our species here. So we have the bostricid. So again, this could just be the native um, bostricid uh, insects in the environment, not necessarily lesser grain borer. Then we have the lesser grain borer and the larger grain borer. So you can see here that from about June to August, we see the flight or capture of those native bostricids. And we see that coincide with the lesser grain borer as well. Then that kind of drops off and we see the flight of the larger grain borer begin around September um, and then kind of trailing off in November. But we also see another peak for the lesser grain borer um, flying around that same period of time in October to November. 
So now I've talked to you a little bit about the collaborative trapping that we did. Let's get into some of the results for what we actually found on the cuticle of these insects. So I don't have the data today for all of our natural environments, which is a really interesting part, I know, um, but I'm just going to talk to you about the lab colony. So this is really the baseline for what we're finding on these insects. So my objective was to investigate the microbes associated with the cuticle of the maize weevil, Cytophilus zea maize, and the larger grain borer, Prostephanus truncatus. And then um, I hypothesized that actually the microbial communities for both of these insects would be unique, but not because they're on the same substrate, but because maybe there's life history traits that might be separating what microbes are present. So this is just a brief overview of my materials and methods. So I took the insects from the colony, maize weevil or larger grain borer. I had kind of an in-between sanitized space that I placed the insects into before placing them on agar. And this is because it kind of simulates movement through the environment. So kind of moving through an in-between space to the next food patch. So we have the insects are held in this in-between space for 0, 24, or 72 hours. And after that time, they're placed on the agar petri dish. They're left on the dish for three and five days. And then we take photographs at the three and five day mark so that we can capture and later quantify microbial growth visually. And we did this using a software called ImageJ, which allows you to calculate the percentage of the Petri dish that's been colonized by the microbials. And then after that, um, I isolated unique morphotypes of the fungus. So this could be um, something that looks just visually different from the others. I isolated those um, different fungal types and grow them out until they're in a pure culture. And then I did DNA extraction, um, PCR, to get an ID. So here's just some photos to demonstrate kind of what my setup looked like. So here you can see my um, camera looking over the dish, photographing um, the microbes in each dish at three and five days. Then obviously this incubator here holding my cultures. And then here's some DNA extraction. So after I've um, created the pure cultures, you can see I'm extracting portions um, and then using a, a DNA extraction kit um, to identify our different types of fungus. And so here's some of the results for microbial growth. So here I have the mean grayscale value. So this is really just microbial growth, but as calculated using image J. And then on the x-axis, I have dispersal period. So either that zero hour holding time, 24 hour holding time, or 72 hour holding time. And then blue is three days and yellow is five days. And so this is for the maize weevil. You can see um, that over the dispersal times here, there's not really a significant difference. You can see that though slightly, there's actually a decrease in the microbial growth when the insects are held in that in-between sanitized space for longer periods of time. But generally, um, at each of these times, microbial growth is increasing from the three to five day. So obviously, given two more days, more fungus is growing. For the larger grain borer, we have the same presentation of the graph, but here you can actually see that as we move um, through the increasing holding time, we're actually seeing more microbial growth. So this is the zero hour holding time. You can see the microbial growth is fairly low, but there is an increase from three to five days um, throughout the times. But you can see that that microbial growth really increases after 24 and 72 hour holding times. And then this is the same data, but I'm just presenting it here in kind of an overview so you can notice the differences between the two species. So you'll notice here that for dispersal time, um, you know, we're seeing that the larger grain borer is vectoring much less in terms of microbial growth. So the amount that they're vectoring compared to the maize weevil, the maize weevil is vectoring a lot more just in terms of growth, so not necessarily species. And then we see the same picture here. Obviously, we're seeing an increase in growth from three to five days, but we're seeing much more for the maize weevil compared to the larger green borer. So just to summarize here, our microbial growth was increasing um, with increased dispersal period for the larger green borer, but it actually decreased for the maize weevil. 
Um, we saw the maize weevil vectored more microbes compared to the larger grain borer. So again, not necessarily in terms of identity or species, but the amount that was being vectored. And then we saw obviously, not surprisingly, microbial growth increased for both species when given that three to five day period. So now let's jump into the results as far as the microbial community that we're finding here. So this is just an overview of the microbial community for both larger grain borer and maize weevil. We can see we have a variety of different fungal species here, but 36% alone is just Aspergillus flavus. So this is important because Aspergillus flavus specifically uh, vectors uh, mycotoxins or aflatoxins. And so we also see there's a few other Aspergillus species here that make up, it's reaching towards 40% of what's being vectored. But we also have some other common species. We have Fusarium here, Penicillium, and some Rhizopus in this community. But now let's look at this separated out for the species. So you can see that for the larger grain borer, we're seeing about 31% of what is being vectored is Aspergillus flavus. And we're seeing those other Aspergillus species. We're also seeing um, penicillium here at 11% for one of those. But we're also seeing some of the fusarium here as well. So we found 15 different taxa from H. nera for the larger grain borer. Interestingly, we see a little bit less in terms of diversity for the maize weevil, but we see this percentage of Aspergillus drastically increase. So we see 42% with 6% being Aspergillus niger. So we're seeing here almost 50% being vectored just Aspergillus by the maize weevil. Um, but then we can also see, again, we do have some Fusarium here um, as well as Penicillium. So here are just some culture dishes to highlight some of the actual pictures of the common types of fungus that we found, the Aspergillus flavus, the Aspergillus niger, and then Penicillium and Fusarium species. So just to summarize, there was a lot of overlap between the two microbial communities. This is not surprising since it's from a colony and they're both on the same maize substrate in the lab. Um, but the interesting part is that Aspergillus species were the most abundant um, being vectored. And this is important, again, because it has human and animal health concerns. So just to conclude, like I said, this is really important result um, for bettering our sanitation and food safety and the post-harvest environment. And as we see the larger grain borers move into these new areas, as it is an invasive insect pest, also under climate change, we're definitely going to be seeing microbes moving with it. So now I want to completely switch gears and talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I did during my master's um, in Haiti. And so for this project, I was assessing post-harvest harvest management practices for smallholder farmers in a region of Haiti. So here um, is the study time and frame. I was doing this research in the cul-de-sac plains, which is highlighted over these three main departments in Haiti. So Haiti split into departments. You can see these three are to Bonit, Center, and West, and it's where most of the agricultural production actually takes place. Um, and I was sampling from July through August in 2017. I targeted a minimum of 300 farmers, and I requested farmers through a farmer association type structure. So um, when the large earthquake happened in Haiti and there was a lot of devastation, a lot of aid organizations came in. And when they did this, they made a requirement or a stipulation that for farmers to receive aid, they needed to be organized by association. So at this time, many farmers in different areas organized themselves into groups, and that's why I found that I had to request farmers through this organization. I used a data collection tool called Kobo Toolbox, which was downloaded on tablets. This allowed me to give my survey in the field electronically, and then as soon as I had Wi-Fi access, all my data uploaded to the cloud. And then my survey was conducted in the native language there, which is Haitian Creole. Um, French is the official language, but you will find most farmers speak Haitian Creole and not everyone speaks French. Um, so I hired enumerators or surveyors who could then deliver my survey in Creole. 
in the end, I ended up surveying about 214 farmers, and I tried to split this um, evenly over the different um, departments, but it was not exactly possible. So I had 80 from West, 63 from Center, and 71 from Archbonite. And then I received data on the grains that they produced and stored, their storage techniques and drying techniques, different pest problems they had, pesticide usage, and then I asked each association, what are your biggest challenges and what are your needs? So I analyzed the data. Um, I had to translate it, download clean code. I used SPSS for this. And then I calculated percentages of farmers who gave similar responses and divided this between the departments. Anyone who did not respond was excluded from the tabulation. So here, it's a lot of data, but I just want to highlight the important demographics. So here we can see um, that across the different departments, it's mostly male. So it is kind of even in the West Department of those that we surveyed, but you can see in the center in Arta Benit, it's 63, almost 64% male farmers and 77.5 um, male farmers in Arta Benit. We also see um, that the average age here was um, definitely over 40. We see most of our farmers in the 50 plus range. Um, so not really a lot of young farmers. And then we see the highest level of education for just over half of our farmers is secondary school. So here I just want to highlight some of the different crops that are grown. We can see maize is the most commonly grown crop. We also have beans coming in second, and then we have sorghum, but they also produce some rice, peanuts, millet, and soybeans as well. Then I have the quantity of grain produced. So here we have the percent of farmers um, answering and the quantity of grain produced in kg. Um, and I just want to highlight, first of all, that over 50% of our farmers are producing their crops on just less than 1.3 hectares, and they may not even own that land. They might be renting it. So here you can see that our average production is about just under 300 kg of maize and under 100 kg for, be for beans. So they're producing very small quantities. And as I found out, most of this was simply just for day-to-day -day subsistence. So I asked farmers about their pre-storage practices. Um, so we had 98.5% uh, saying that they just left their grain um, in the sun to dry, either in the field, where you did see some people trying to dry their grain on the sides of the roads, um, where the asphalt was providing some extra heat. Um, and most of the farmers, as a result, reported that um, drying, the biggest challenges was rain, because it's raining a really a lot um, in Haiti during the growing season. Um, and then we asked the farmers about um, what pests they were really struggling with um, in storage. And so you can see that um, the farmers, first of all, I'll point out, were allowed to respond to more than one option. So that's why we see this is not adding up to 100% um, across. But you can see that most of the farmers are responding and saying insects are the biggest challenge, followed by rodents, decay, meaning maybe mold or fungal growth. And then we have birds, animals, and theft. So here you can see an actual photo of some of the drying and processing that was taking place on the side of the road as we were driving by. Then again, um, we have the quantity of grain stored. So we had the quantity of grain produced. This is what's being stored. Um, you can see that the percent of the farmers is here and almost 80% are saying that they're storing less than 100 kgs for both maize and beans. And as far as the duration of storage, we're seeing that for maize, it's kind of an even split, um, one third, one third and one third. So one third said less than three months, they're storing about one third said three to six months, they're storing maize. And then a third said they're storing their maize for greater than six months. But it seemed that beans was being more um, frequently used right away. So you can see that almost half say they're storing it less than three months. Um, and then almost the other half are storing it the three to six months period. Here you can just see some traditional methods of storing in Haiti. So you can see here, um, storing some grain inside of this gourd um, or squash. And then you can see this elevated structure being used. Um, you see the ladder here and then inside they have these different storage containers trying to keep the grain elevated and away from pests. 
And then you can see most farmers were actually using a variety of different containers just in a room in the household or a storage um, space outside. So most were using different sacks, but you can see um, like an oil drum being used to store grain there. And so revisiting the causes of loss um, during grain storage, they actually reported um, almost 80% said rodents were the biggest cause of loss during the storage, so not the pre-storage. Um, and then insects coming in at about 60%, and then a lot less attention was being paid to um, mold and theft. Um, but some people actually said there was no damage. So I didn't actually get to inspect the grain, but sometimes you know, people aren't really looking or they're not sure what to look for. So they might say none when there actually is still damage. So you can see the rodents here, the insects. And then this is um, some corn that I actually inspected. You can see that there's some um, growth taking place here. It looks like some of the maize might've been wet and might've already started germinating, but now it's dry. And so you can imagine there's some fungus um, growing here. And then I really wanted to know what store product insects are in Haiti. I wanted to get samples from each of the farmers associations and actually survey the insect pests, but this wasn't really possible. Um, at the time that we went, most farmers didn't have grain available to give. Um, so I did do some digging in the literature and found at least a few stored product insects that are known to be on the island of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which is the neighboring nation. Um, you can see, we see the rice weevil, the maize weevil, some bean and pea weevils, um, sawtooth grain beetle, really common, and then some common um, stored products, moths, that you'll see down here. So most of the common pests are probably expected to be in Haiti. Then I asked our farmers, um, insect pest control method during storage. So what were they doing to prevent this damage? Um, most of our farmers, over half, um, said they were using chemical methods to control the insects. Some said they were using natural methods, so just under 20%. But we actually saw over 20%, I think around that 30% range, said they were doing absolutely nothing to prevent the, the losses during storage. We also wanted to know, so if you're not using chemicals, why? What is the reason? Um, and most of them actually said, um, half said it was because they were worried about toxic or health problems associated with the chemical usage. They also reported maybe they just didn't have access to the chemical tools for controlling the pests, or there wasn't information available about how to use the, the chemical control or information available about where to get the chemical control. And then some said it was too expensive or they just simply didn't have enough grain to store. So they weren't really worried about that kind of control. And then a small portion said it just wasn't effective. So to summarize what I found, um, our smallholder farmers in Haiti heavily rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. As I mentioned, most of these farmers are not growing to sell, they're growing just to eat every day. And then drying was a really big challenge in Haiti. As I mentioned, they don't really have covered areas where they can dry the crop. Um, they leave it in the field and there's a lot of rain um, that comes through and impedes their ability to, to dry. They also reported insects and rodents, not surprisingly, were the biggest pests of their grain. And half of our farmers are using chemical products to protect their grain, but over 25% say they're doing nothing to control any pests in their grain stores. And as a result, storage is a challenge. Not a lot of storage structures available. Um, and as you saw, looking for different sacks or bags or drums that they can use or using those natural gourds to store their grain. So um, we kind of highlighted some things that farmers told us could be useful based on what they were experiencing. As I said, we asked them what they needed and what their biggest challenges were. So farmers really were asking for sheltered spaces for drying. They needed humidity gauges to be able to tell when is the grain ready for storage. And then they wanted better storage technology to prevent these insects and rodents from causing damage. And so I actually find out, I took this photo, um, I found out that some of the associations that I interviewed had actually been part of a previous intervention um, by UMCOR here. After the devastation of the earthquake, they gave some of these silos to some of the farmers associations. 
They also gave out some humidity gauges and some tarps for drying, but that was only a small portion of the farmers who received these. Um, and as you can imagine, it was kind of um, being managed collectively. So not each individual farmer had this, it was just on the association's property. So future directions, what I really wanted to go back and do um, or do in the future was estimate actual post-harvest grain losses in Haiti. I wanted to get my hands on some actual grain samples, um, look at for aflatoxin, moisture content, germination rate, look at the insect damage, rodent damage, and try to survey the, the insect pests that were present um, in Haiti. So with that, um, I wanna acknowledge all my funding sources and my support, all of you here at CIMIT who helped make my PhD research possible. Um, all of those in my lab at the USDA and Kansas State University. I wanna give special thanks to all those in Haiti who made the project possible. Um, I went by myself, had to hire enumerators and, and find people to work with. So I was so grateful um, for the help of these people here. I couldn't have done it without them. So with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Silvanus, um, Natalia, oh, sorry, Natalia Palacios is also raising her hand. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, should we start online and then continue? Okay. Please, Natalia, go ahead. No, actually, I was just clapping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, I saw in your presentation you presented from the, the insect study, um, mm -hmm. just from the preliminary results. Um, I was wondering if it was something that you've seen about the, the difference in between all the different sites. Okay, one example. Maybe the data yeah. are yeah, so I'm not sure I can really highlight the differences between the row, the natural, um, and the storage facility, but I can kind of highlight the difference between those and the lab. So in the field, we saw a lot more being vectored on the petri dishes, specifically by the maize weevil, because I haven't had a chance to actually capture larger grain bore in the field actually something I wanted to do here, but I didn't get a chance yet. Um, but for the maize weevil, there was so much more um, diversity in what was being spread on the dish. And actually there was more bacteria colonizing the dish than there was fungus. So this is something just kind of interesting that I noticed. It could also be um, because of the type of agar or kind of substrate used. So this was just kind of a starting place with that, you know, generic potato dextrose agar, but you could kind of select um, for maybe more bacteria or fungus based on what kind of, you know, substrate you're using in the Petri dish. But initially, a lot of bacterial contamination, so much bacterial contamination. Okay, thank you. And maybe just an idea on your timeline on, on when we'd be able to see the other results? Yeah, so I just finished up defending. It's kind of been a whirlwind. I've had to do a lot of travel, but this is actually my last scheduled travel for the summer. So as soon as I get back, I'm going to be wrapping up stuff. And I think maybe by the end of the summer, I should be able to share all that with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Additional question? I do have many questions. <laughs> okay, uh, so you rightly pointed out that uh, with climate change, that we could we could see a movement of, of I mean, a shift in the habitat of of uh, some of the invasive pests, particularly the larger grain borer. So my question is, how could we anticipate that, and how could we try to manage our, our future threat uh, to food security? Particularly in the in the in the region, for example, in Africa, where we can have the larger grain border moving from, uh, I would say, sub-Saharan Africa to north of Africa, for example. Yeah. So I know one of the ways that we can kind of start to look at that is by modeling. So I know there's been some recent studies by um, some of my colleagues in my group at the USDA. Um, I think there was a paper by Dr. Frank Arthur in 2019. Um, they did kind of a modeling for the larger grain borer and where they might see it moving. Um, but I also know a new postdoc in our lab is kind of picking up that work now um, and doing a new improved modeling um, for that. And I think maybe the capra beetle as well. Um, so I think the first starting place is kind of modeling. Obviously, we can't be like, you know, 
the temperature is definitely going to increase this much and we're going to see the insect here, but we can start to look and predict where we might see it moving next. And I think some of the results with the modeling, we, it would definitely be suitable habitat like in the southern United States and definitely moving northward into Af in the African regions there. Um, and we could definitely see some in like those Mediterranean areas of, the, of Europe, which we've already seen some of the insects in Italy and Greece. So I would say we have to start with modeling and try to base our predictions um, and then, you know, take steps, continue advocating for research on these invasive insect pests that will prepare us um, with insect pest management tools um, when that insect actually arrives. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, regarding your research in Haiti, or Haiti, as you say, I'm a French speaker, so <laughs> I say Haiti. So, uh, I mean, I was just wondering if post-harvest is the main issue raised by these farmers because they produce such as, I mean, the yield gap there should be really high because two, 200 or um, less than 300 kilograms is very small and, and to feed a whole family. So uh, is there, uh, do they really highlight post-harvest as the main problem? And is there a difference of perspective between men and women? Because I, I, I noticed that you also survey some women farmers. Yeah, so to answer your first question, I would say they have a lot more urgent needs than post-harvest. Um, many of the farmers were asking me about sorghum, and specifically they're asking me about a pest I think they called it pisson, and it was basically I discovered through pictures was a white fly. And so they told me that they really wanted to grow sorghum there, um, that they grew sorghum in the past successfully. But with the invasion of the white fly, it was devastating their crops. And aid organizations were just telling them or the government was just telling them, move on from sorghum, grow something else. But they didn't want to. They want they were asking me. Um, whoever would listen for resources so that they can combat the white fly and continue to grow sorghum like they wanted. So I actually heard this from almost every group that I went to. They were asking me about the white fly and they were asking me about what can they do for their sorghum. So that was something that I actually discovered. I think most of their challenges that were they were most concerned about were in pre-harvest in the field because they didn't even get a chance to get to the post-harvest. You know, they're losing most of their crop in the field first and, you know, they might have some left to store, but they wanted to be able to have better yields. So that was a challenge. There were a few groups that were very large organized associations. So they had a lot more money input. They had a lot more mechanization and tools. And they were exporting a lot of their grain, not exporting. They were sending it to other regions in Haiti. And they were asking me, how can we export outside Haiti? But obviously I was like, I'm just a student. I can't really arrange that for you. But those are some of the things that I saw. I did go to one association that was all women's farmers association. Um, they had a lot of the same challenges, but what they talked to me about was kind of that disparity. Like, you know, they had less opportunity to own land if they were given the chance um, because of, you know, the kind of the gender roles and structure. Um, they told me that the women were doing most of the marketing and stored like post-harvest activities. Um, I think one um, farmer told me that the men couldn't go to the market because there were like people who would go to the market. And if you were a man, they would like try to steal your crop and like beat you up or something. Um, but if the woman went, they wouldn't like bother her. So there was like some interesting like marketing like issues that they had. Um, and so these women really wanted access to inputs. So the one association, she like told me this really like amazing story. I mean, it almost sounds like I made it up, but like she literally had like a clip art kind of thing that she made with like a woman, like kind of uh, photographed onto like a tractor on her like association manual. So most of the farmers have their like association manual. And she told me like she hopes that when I come back to Haiti next, I would see women in her association actually driving tractors because for them, driving the tractor was like the, the symbol of like being a successful farmer that the men had and that they didn't have. So I learned a lot about that <laughs> while I was in Haiti. Oh, thank you. Uh, interesting. So I, I saw that you went there in 2017. Have you been able to 
keep in touch with them or with the current situation in Haiti, do you think there's scope to go back and to keep working? Simit has done very little work in Haiti because of the difficult conditions, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, um, I was actually going to go back, but that was right before a lot of the riots broke out um, with the fuel crisis, the fuel tax crisis there. Um, and then obviously after that, the president was assassinated and things have kind of deteriorated further. But it was really my goal and hope to return because a lot of these farmers actually didn't even want to talk to me until they found out I was a student because they said so many people come here like aid workers and you know they just like make empty promises or like tell us these things and nothing ever changes so we don't want to talk to them but they really supported students and were well aware you know of students trying to get their master's or their PhD. So that was honestly the only reason that they talked to me in a lot of cases. And so I just really felt like this burden of like, I want to show them that I actually am going to try to, obviously I couldn't promise them anything. I'm like, I'm a student. I'm writing my thesis. I can't like fix anything, but I can at least keep my word to publish your story um, and try to like do it justice and I had really hoped that I could go back and visit each of those associations and, you know, follow up, but I haven't had that chance yet, but it's still something I really wish that I could do. Um, I was able to meet a lot of these farmers associations through a worker for another like government um, program. I would have to get the name for you because I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. Um, he wasn't like officially working with that organization with me. He was kind of like working unofficially with me, but through their help, he had all the contacts to all the farmers. So I hope I can go back someday actually, but I was at least able to share the publication with him and ask if he could like share it with the farmers, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have additional question? Maybe online? Ah, okay, Gabby. Why was the reason to choose Haiti, the country? I suppose that there are a lot of countries that have the similar uh, climatic uh, conditions. So why this? Yeah, so why? we had um, a fellow colleague at Purdue um, who is doing a lot of research in Haiti in kind of another area. Um, and so we had a lot of contacts there. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the funding that I received, we had anonymous donor who was like, I want you to use this money for research in, in this specific country. So that's kind of the reason why I went. Okay. Thank you. Someone else? Do we have some question online? No, Silvanos, we don't have any questions online. And also I don't see any hand raised. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. We can close, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, thanks for coming.